Hey everybody, it's Joe DeGanzik on Lighting Answers, and this is our wrap-up episode for CES 2016. A humongous show, as always, up in Las Vegas, covering many more categories than what we cover here. Obviously, lighting and smart bulbs and home, smart home, home automation, IoT, whatever you want to call it. That whole space that we cover. Many more categories, technology services, it's, it's all at CES. We're going to start with our wrap-up of lighting because lighting wasn't really a humongous category. Because lighting is, uh, CES is not a lighting show per se. There are others uh, out there during the year that we'll cover for you. And manufacturers tend to make their own announcements outside of these trade shows. But anyways, in terms of smart bulbs and multifunction devices, that was a trend that we definitely saw. We saw it starting a bit last year, but even more pronounced this year. So 2016, we're going to continue to see these devices that are their LED lights, but they do more than that. Obviously, we're familiar with LED lights that have smarts in them, whether they're Bluetooth based and they change colors, they're Wi-Fi based and they change colors or they have uh, multiple functions in one and now that includes adding speakers for potential home whole home whole house audio applications in addition uh, microphones for listening to alerts and issues and problems um, that might be going on the beyond bulbs announced a few months back able to listen for a doorbell per se someone that might be casing your home and replay the lights exactly as they would be turned off and turned on by you when you were actually home. So these type of innovative products that are coming out in the market, I think are going to be either a hit or they're going to be a dud. Personally, I am pretty picky about my light, obviously, as, as you can tell by someone who would start a YouTube channel on a website such as this. So I'm pretty picky about them and not LED, not all LED lights or CFL or incandescent or halogen live up to my own standards. So why would I invest more money into a product that also did something else that also might not live up to my standards? And how do you deal with speakers? Are they mono? Are they stereo? What if you have a kitchen full of downlights? Do you replace all of them or most of them with these LED bulb speakers and have a boombox kitchen out coming out of your ceiling? I don't know. No one really knows because we're barely into the market, but you can bet that we will be reviewing at least one of these multifunction products, probably more, on the show during 2016 to show you whether these really live up to this hype or not. For the average consumer who wants to upgrade to LED lights and possibly do you know, more with sound uh, or do some home security, this could be a fantastic total win product. It's just going to depend on the market and who's buying it and what the, uh, the marketing spin on it truly is and whether you're also going to find these things in stores. Sometimes when you're looking at a new product from a new manufacturer that you've never heard of just online, it may or may not be a easy sell. Sometimes these are easier to actually have in person and take a look at it and see, is this really gonna work? What's the size of it? Does it really look good? And I guess if it's a bulb that you're, in, you're screwing into a can light, eh, maybe not. Although Sony did show off a really cool kind of glass, um, glass-based, sort of almost like a lantern-looking LED. It wasn't a huge thing at the show in terms of it wasn't making news, but it's out there and it should be coming to the U.S. Um, sometime this year as well. That looked pretty cool. It didn't have a speaker, I don't think, um, probably did, but on some level, but it looked pretty cool. For the rest of the LED lighting segment for 2016, it's a little more cloudy because that the LED world of general illumination and also for specific you know, types of lamps like flood lamps and spotlights and whatnot, they have both evolved rapidly over the past couple of years, especially with Cree entering the market for general light bulbs like this one, which is the guts of <laughs> the one that we broke a few months ago on purpose, uh, the guts of one of their original light bulbs. 
at the end of the day, the this market has advanced, it has matured rapidly, and a good percentage of the people who have already now upgraded to these modern LED bulbs are going to be much harder to convince to buy a new LED bulb that saves another, what, half a watt or one watt of power. I personally think that the killer app is to actually make an LED bulb that A, it looks like, near exactly a traditional light bulb. And there's two camps of thought on that. One is, well, we, we want something that looks identical to what we're used to because we don't like change. Or B, let's have something that looks new and futuristic. And I'm kind of torn between those two. But basically, number one, make it for many consumers who want to just keep things the same. Make it look exactly like an old-fashioned light bulb. Make it light up like an old-fashioned light bulb, you know, even multi, you know, uh, omnidirectional light. Um, since LEDs have the promise of being uh, less in terms of heat output, let's have less heat output, let's have a heat sink that doesn't get very hot. And dimming, and dimming is combined with the color temperature when you dim the bulb. I have kind of two thoughts on this. A, I've been under LED light for several years now across my entire home in multiple locations. Can I honestly say that I miss the warm glow dimming? You know, you get that fiery glow because of the um, traditional filaments in halogen and traditional incandescent bulbs that glow at a much warmer color temperature, more yellowish golden color temperature when you dim them down. Do I honestly miss that? Well, yeah, I kind of do. Things don't look the same under dimmed LED light that doesn't change color as they do under that warm glow. We, you know, we did a, um, a Valentine's Day episode about a year ago or so, and we talked about that. We talked about candles and whatnot, but you don't get that same type of light. Now, several companies, um, Sylvania, Philips, among others, have worked on these type of bulbs, but neither has truly nailed it. Philips has come pretty close, but still not quite there. Usually it turns out too yellow uh, or too weird looking on one end or the, or the actual temperature, the color temperature of the light changes too rapidly or doesn't change fast enough during that dimming process. So you've got to make sure that the dimming works really well. Now, there have been companies that have already done this successfully, TCP being one of them, and I use exclusively their, um, their products for, uh, for uplighting and for their PAR bulbs because they nailed it, absolutely. Um, so it's possible to do. I think it's also possible to do the mimicking of the old warm glow technology. I don't think it's a problem. I think the manufacturers just have to get it right. It's probably a cost issue as most things are in mass manufacturing products. So at the end of the day, it's doable. People have done it. So let's get it done, lighting industry. So I think those are a couple of the things that really have to be there. And if someone actually nails it, they come out with a general purpose bulb that is priced at a competitive price. Let's say it's somewhere around the five to $6 mark. That seems to be the sweet spot uh, for getting people to just try these bulbs out it's got a long lifetime, it's got a great color rendering, it's got the um, perfect dimming, no flickering, no seeing the little steps of, dim of dimming as you go down. For those of us who really do care about quality dimming, and it's got that wonderful warm glow effect as well. You've got all of that and a light bulb that looks like a light bulb, lights up like a light bulb. Obviously that saves energy as well. You nail it. If someone does that this year, Whoever they are, they will probably win the game, and they can probably convince people, along with us reviewers, um, to get you to buy a new LED bulb if you've already bought one. And of course, if you haven't moved to LED yet, it's easier to make that switch because you're not yet invested in that ecosystem. Sure, you might be invested in CFL, but we all know that CFL isn't the greatest for most things, certain industries and certain things it worked out pretty well um, and it's okay. I still think LED is a better light, but obviously um, 
certain people and perhaps even dogs uh, like CFL or like different types of light uh, depending on the application and depending on um, what you're used to. I happen to be sensitive, um, not overly sensitive to flickering light, but for especially those early LEDs and those early CFL bulbs, which were awful, I would just look at them and go, oh, this is terrible, turn it off, give me, give me something old fashioned that works better and looks better. But today's LEDs and to a certain extent today's uh, CFL bulbs, if that's your thing, not a bad choice. So in 2016, a manufacturer has to really nail it because there's not that many attributes left. You can't wring too much more energy efficiency out of LED bulbs. Beyond 2016, harder to look into the future, but it's going to be OLED and other types of super efficient, uh, not just super efficient, but super flexible and unique types of lighting sources that we're gonna see built because they're not gonna need to be constrained to this standard shape of traditional light bulbs and we'll see lighting actually built into fixtures then you'll wonder if you want to replace the fixture, you got to replace the light and the fixture at the same time, which raises more questions that we're not going to answer on this particular show. Home kit, much of a bigger news thing for CES 2015 than 2016, if you ask me for my opinion of it. And looking at the products that came out, which were largely some were actual just upgrades of existing products. Some were new by the same manufacturer who may have already had certain uh, HomeKit enabled products. I think that HomeKit is great. All right, I think HomeKit is good. We know what it can do. It's Apple's home automation system, connects all your devices um, securely together and you can control them from Siri on your iOS device. And if you've got an Apple TV, uh, third or fourth generation, you can also take that control not just inside your home, but outside your home as well. That's great. Um, is HomeKit ever going to be enormous? Is, is Apple going to license it out beyond the Apple ecosystem? Probably not. They haven't licensed FaceTime out of the Apple ecosystem yet, and they said they were going to make that an open standard, and they ran into uh, lots of problems there. HomeKit needs a push from Apple. We know the manufacturers have had their devices out there, iDevices, iHome, now Hunter fans, um, a plethora of devices. They're available. Lutron, the Casita wireless uh, system, um, that got upgraded. Insteon got upgraded. You know, just keep naming off manufacturers. We've got a, a fairly wide variety of devices that you can choose from and you can connect up to your iOS ecosystem and to then talk to with Siri. The challenge is the implementation. The new Insteon hub has less features than the hub um, that I don't want to say it replaced, but that it succeeded because you can still buy the old hub. Due to Apple's security requirements, um, not all of the things that you could do with the old Insteon hub, you can do with the new one for HomeKit. So that's a challenge. Insteon's initial app was awful. Lots of people complained about it and they've made some improvements. We have yet to review it on this show just for that very reason. And HomeKit is something that I like to sort of joke about during the teases of these episodes and we do some demos, but you may wonder if I use it in my regular daily life. And the answer is no. Now, after you look away from your computer monitor and wonder, have I lost my mind? Um, no, I'm not crazy. And the reason I don't use HomeKit is because it doesn't work for me. I could use HomeKit, but it would be for a very small fraction of what I would use in my daily life here. The reason is, is because this guy is actually controlling a good majority of my home automation along with Insteon and perhaps Barking Dogs. Is that an echo in this episode? Anyways, um, Indigo is my software hub that connects a number of my smart home devices from Insteon to Nest to um, geolocation and whatnot. So HomeKit, and HomeKit cannot really, uh, without a bunch of gobbledygook uh, voodoo programming, cannot talk to Indigo, therefore it cannot talk to the rest of my devices and help me out. The closest thing that I could get to is probably the Amazon Echo, which would allow me to interface to IFTTT or to some of the other things um, that I've got, trigger certain um, lighting scenes through, again, some voodoo magic, 
Um, but it's a little bit clunky. And if it's one thing is I hate clunky home automation. Uh, I, ha I hate it when things don't work and I love it when things do work. So for me, HomeKit just doesn't work. It's not very helpful for me because I already have an investment into my home automation system. Now you might say, well, just get the Insteon Hub. You don't need that Indigo thing. Well, Indigo is actually a lot more powerful than the Insteon Hub. I hate to tell it to you. Um, the Insteon Hub is there for consumers who just want to get started with home automation, do a number of simple things, and use it all from your app. And that's it. For me, I'm a power user. And, well, there we go. Anyways, um, so HomeKit, not terribly useful for me could be um, quite useful for you. It needs a push from Apple. It needs a home application, just like HealthKit, Apple's health ecosystem, um, has a centralized health app that actually stores all the information and lets you manipulate it to a certain extent. Um, there are some apps that have come out, one of which that we're looking at right now, um, that are that replacement because Apple hasn't released a home app. They also haven't really pushed HomeKit that far. You don't see ads coming out all about HomeKit and all about the smart home. You don't really see it being pushed that hard. It's more of an afterthought in their um, announcements in terms of at their WWDC conferences and, uh, and even at um, their individual product announcements. So we need a push from Apple. We need it to be there. Apple probably waited on products coming out. So now you, you had a chicken and egg problem. So I expect, well, let's say, I hope that we see some big push from Apple at the next WWDC. It is time now for them to release iOS 10, which is a kind of a big number and perhaps a big deal within, um, within Apple. So we'll see what this year brings. I don't want to make any promises and have to say that I'm going to take them back, but I think HomeKit needs to get better. I think Siri needs to be able to get better in terms of recognizing kind of similar names to what you might call a particular device or a particular scene because if you um, if you forget what they're named you have a problem and honestly many times it's easier to look things up via a scrolling list and just tap something and try to remember what did I call that light was it corner up light was it corner lamp it's not always intuitive Voice commands always work well on TV and in sci-fi because they are scripted. But in real life, it's a little bit different, um, especially for home automation and a category that we're still trying to make sense of and um, seeing how the industry is going to go forward. So HomeKit, I think, will get better this year. We'll see more products for it. But it's really not the products. It's the push from Apple. It's the, it's the overall push to, to get this to make more sense and to get more people using it and then to get more people excited about it and kind of just keeps pushing in that direction. So there you have it. And finally, well, maybe not finally, home automation, the big term, the smart home, the internet of things, it's more confusing than ever. And here's why. Home automation used to be just for the nerds and the geeks and those who wanted to connect all this stuff together. It started with the clapper. <laughs> nope, obviously I don't have one, nothing changed. Um, it started with things like the clapper. It continued with things like X10, uh, which I used to run on this guy, which you can't see, the good old JDS time commander for from 20 years ago, literally. I had that in my dorm room. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I was doing home automation in my college dorm room. People thought I was nuts. But anyways, um, we had X10. Home automation was literally just a way of, of trying to cross connect all your devices, probably impress your friends. And there was a lot of it that was sort of magic voodoo work and hard wiring certain things. And there were very few standards. There were very few accessories. Some of it was people were just building and creating their own stuff. This thing wouldn't connect to the internet. I built my own web interface in 1998 before most home automation systems were connected. Um, I wanted to control uh, my lights and kind of annoy and kind of scare my roommates into thinking the place had gone crazy. Um, and I did a pretty good job of it. But anyway, so it used to be just for the geeks and the nerds and then home automation got a little bit simpler. Let's fast forward to today 
um, and to people like smart things trying to upend the market and create a really nifty, cool, sort of sexy um, home automation hub that would work with a lot of stuff, right? And then people buy it and they're like, wow, this is cool, I can do all this stuff. And I, I, I loaded the app onto my iPhone. So I should be able to control um, smart things with Siri, right? Wrong. Of course, Apple and Samsung are bitter rivals, so you're probably never going to see HomeKit on smart things because, of course, smart things is now owned by Samsung. So that's just one challenge now in the home automation wars. You've got all these different ecosystems. You've also got the older ecosystems we'll just play with Insteon again, um, that have to come into the future, right? Insteon and its devices were never internet enabled. They were never app enabled like we're used to because these devices didn't exist when Insteon and the older technologies, say like X10, were created. So they have to come into the future. Um, older systems that I don't particularly talk about a lot in this show, things like Vera, things like Homeseer. These are older sort of, I'll call them legacy products. They weren't created with apps originally. They were standalone devices. You plugged them in via USB or a serial cable. You had to keep the computer on. Many households don't have PCs anymore. They don't have these dedicated computers running all the time um, or even going into sleep mode. So it's a different world these days and the world seems to change about every two to three years in the consumer electronics world. And now, of course, that is very tied in with home automation because you've got people like Google and Apple coming into the fray and then Google buying Nest, Nest buying Revolve. I mean, I could go on and on and on. What I'm getting at is that home automation today is more confusing than ever. You have a multiple standards. You have multiple companies saying, our standard is the best. You want it. Okay. Well, why do we want your standard? And should a company like Google be trusted to create a standard that's going to connect all of the Internet of Things devices and all of the home automation devices? Should it be more of an independent consortium like the Wi-Fi um, organization or like the Bluetooth organization, creating some sort of standard that's going to bring all these devices together? Personally, I think it should be an independent organization. But before I get off too much on that tangent, Back to the point of home automation is confusing. There's HomeKit, right? Not exactly a standard, but it rides on top of I internet, um, in internet. It rides on top of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Apple invented the concept. Uh, maybe not the concept. They invented the technology. We'll give them that, right? And the framework. Google's working on something similar, but a little bit of a larger um, project with Nest Weave, Google Weave, and Brillo. Why there are two weaves, no one seems to quite know except that they were kind of created separately and then they were merged and they were diverged and whatever. They are apparently separate projects um, and Google and Nest are going to use them in different and unique ways. Then there's Brillo, of course, and then there's Thread, which Nest is a part of and thus Google somehow is a part of that as well. Thread is not exactly a home automation system or protocol like Zigbee or Z-Wave or Insteon, but yet apparently there's going to be a thread certification logo that shows up on consumer devices, but that will add to consumer confusion because people will say, oh, this has a thread logo and that has a thread logo. They should be able to talk to each other, right? Wrong. The specifics of that would take too much time to explain even on this extended episode, so please read up instead of having me talk to you about it, but thread is not a complete ecosystem for devices uh, such as a Z-Wave or a Zigbee or a Dog Bark. There were a number of other announcements in and around CES, around, of course, home automation, but something a little bit along the sides of home automation, Brandby, maybe around the Internet of Things. And I'm talking about energy harvesting or battery-free devices. And you're wondering, what's that? Well. If you think battery free, the easiest example is the old, or perhaps even current, uh, since I don't own one, uh, solar calculator, right? It gets energy when you put it under a light source of any kind and you can use it. Super, doesn't need a, doesn't need a battery, but maybe it has one just in case you wanna use it in the complete dark. Don't know why, but anyhow, um, devices like this, 
tiny little remote controls. This is the one that can, comes with the uh, Lutron Casita system that takes a little coin cell battery. What if these devices didn't need that, right? So we obviously are familiar with devices that don't need batteries to operate. Um, Philips demonstrated this, not that it was brand new because companies had been working on this for years prior. Philips with the Hue tap device can actually transmit signals right to the Hue bridge, most likely over Zigbee. Zigbee 3.0 um, is, uh, is, that doesn't sound good, Zigbee 3.0 or Zigbee green power or Zigbee low energy, whatever you want to call it, uses this type of low power energy um, to enable devices like, well, not like this, but to be devices like this to become battery free or energy harvesting by simply, you know, tapping a button and it transmits the signal. And Ocean was started by Siemens 15 years ago on this very concept of creating these energy harvesting battery free devices. And they actually just entered into the partnership with Zigbee to integrate this technology into the Zigbee ecosystem and platform. Enerby out of France is also working on these technologies. They want to create their own uh, dimmer switch or wireless light switch that again uses that sort of pressing, uh, pressing motion translates to energy, translates to a signal being transmitted uh, at a low power. And this is where we need to be. If you think about all these devices like I just showed you and others that are going to require all these little batteries, that's an insane amount of batteries. Even if they were rechargeable, it's still a pain and it would be much better to actually be able to have the devices just be battery free completely. Enerby is working. You can uh, go to the website. I think we'll have it in the, uh, the description of this video. Enerby is working on other ways of harvesting uh, power from motion, you know, turning knobs and things like that, that can also do energy transmission and capture that energy. These are these great kind of I wouldn't call them revolutionary, but evolutionary ideas and technologies that are going to be able to enable the internet of things, everything being connected to the cloud. Now, speaking of the internet of things, this cloud, all of these protocols, we have to get there. Where's there? There is all of these things that we're going to have connected to the cloud, connected to the internet. They have to do so over a protocol that makes sense and that is compatible and that is ubiquitous. Right now the home automation or Internet of Things world is cluttered by a zillion different protocols, a zillion different systems, some open, some closed, some being introduced by companies like Google and Nest, others uh, being introduced by people like the Wi-Fi group or is it the Alliance? Whatever it is, personally I don't want the future of home automation or the internet of things or what it, whatever it will be called to be controlled because they invented the platform or the protocol. I don't want them being controlled by Apple as much as I like Apple. I don't want them being controlled by Google as much as I may like some of what Google does. A third party organization I think is the best one, whether that is Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or someone else that we don't even know of at this point. The protocol needs to be ubiquitous. The products need to be compatible with it. Security obviously is a huge concern. That needs to be addressed as well. We have to sort of race to get there because the current situation is a mess. Consumers want stuff that's cool. They hear about something on the news. They hear about it on a show like this. They rush to buy it. They install the app and then they see something else and they want to buy that and they find out that they're not compatible or you have to program around it and they don't have those skills. They don't want to call their friends. So they return everything and they say, I'm just going to go back to the stone ages. All right, that's an extreme example, but you get the idea. And for those of you who are in the home automation space, who've done um, this type of work before, who've tried to make things work and they don't, and you get incredibly frustrated, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And for the future to happen, and I say the future as if it's like this thing that hasn't happened yet, which of course it hasn't because, well, time. For smart homes in the future, say you buy a home that already has smarts in it. Well, what's it compatible with? Do you 
get to hook it up with other stuff that you already have and then find out it doesn't work. Again, lack of standards, lack of ubiquitous standards. We don't have a lack of standards, we just have a lack of um, cross compatibility. And we'll, we will probably continue to see this evolve. Hubs and bridges will allow us to bridge, pardon the pun, technologies back and forth services like IFTTT will get us around there as well as we ultimately get to some sort of moment of a ubiquitous standard that all devices can speak and all devices pretty much must be compatible with. I mean, just imagine if we had conflicts like this with Bluetooth-like devices years ago and if we had had three or four Bluetooth-like standards and you had to buy a headphone A that had to match with car B or, uh, you know, keyboard C or computer D, you know, I mean, Really? That would have been a disaster. But luckily, Bluetooth, either it came out on top and squashed whatever com whatever competition it had, or Bluetooth simply was the only one. And of course, as we know it, the rest is history, and Bluetooth is the ubiquitous um, short-range data transmission technology that we have today. Some might like it, some might hate it, but it's what we have, and at least it's pretty much in everything. Of course, you know, to some extent there are other technologies, but they generally ride on Wi-Fi, things like AirPlay, DLNA, and whatnot. So that's my opinion on protocols and whatnot. We have this, uh, speaking of Wi-Fi and protocols, it could be Wi-Fi's moment, you know, Wi-Fi Halo. It's something that already um, is writing or is based on 802.11ah. That's something that hasn't been certified yet, but will be soon. We could see products start to come out with it because sometimes manufacturers will put it in products uh, even if this the so if, even if the system or the specification hasn't been certified, we've seen that happen before. Anyways, uh, Wi-Fi Halo, or is it Halo? Anyways, it is supposed to be longer range, low power, better to get through buildings and whatnot, um, and more uh, a higher data rate. Also, it'll actually get the internet or the cloud directly to these internet of things instead of hopping from one device to the next like with smart locks many of them are simply bluetooth then you have to go to some sort of bridge device that has to go to your wi-fi that has to go to the router then to the internet multiple hops equals more chance for problems and obviously complicating your setup if you just have a device that gets direct connection um, to the cloud or to the internet of things uh, as it is a thing simpler more reliable and ultimately better the last thing i want to talk about is application and control how do you control all this stuff what is the best application some would say it's voice right amazon echo is huge it's very popular for however many it's sold um, mike elgin who used to be on tech news today on the twit network said it best about a year ago. Amazon Echo is the perfect device. You probably never have to upgrade the hardware. It is a connected speaker. It sounds pretty good. It has all of these um, array uh, of several microphones so that it can do near and distance listening. And it's been a hit. It's, it's fantastic. And now it is compatible with all these different home automation systems because it's communicating to them over the internet. Any so it means that Amazon can work with any company that makes a home automation system or anything at all that is internet connected and it has some sort of open API and work with it. And they have. That is pretty cool. Why don't I have one? Well, because um, I haven't bought one yet and I'll probably get one this year and I'll probably rely on it too much and then you'll hear all about it here on Lighting Answers. But anyways, uh, sometimes we balance things between uh, buying stuff and uh, the budget of the show. But anyhow, behind, behind that, beyond that, voice control is very popular. It's very popular because we saw it in sci-fi, we saw it on all these TV uh, series and movies, and we assume it's gonna be great. But scripted television versus real life is a little bit different. And we know from these um, TV series and movies that controlling things by voice, controlling the Enterprise or the Starship or whatever, is, um, is a multi-modal 
interface, right? It's not just voice, it's not just buttons, it's a combination of those two things. It could be touch screens or whatnot. And the same thing applies in our little world here on Earth is I, I personally like to have physical buttons to push. I don't mind actually using voice when it's applicable. I like to have actual physical uh, buttons or knobs on the wall because it just makes sense for the application. There are companies still trying to solve this um, beyond the voice thing. Um, I just saw another one uh, last night or the night before uh, as a Kickstarter project that I believe has, bare, has just made it to uh, production and they're trying to shoot for the moon and solve all of the problems and do natural voice processing and it looked pretty good will it be a total success i don't know they left off homekit they left off insteon so they're not compatible with everything but they're compatible with most things um there's the neo device that um one of our viewers alerted us to um that was also at um, CES uh, we, that we didn't happen to see. Um, there's also the Seven Hugs remote. Both of those actually do similar things in different ways. Um, it's a physical remote control that's able to change its interface and supposed to be very, very universal and very easy to use and obviously control more than, say, your TV or your stereo. It can control lights and Z-Wave and Zigbee and all of that stuff. So everyone is throwing this stuff at the wall to see what is going to stick. Everyone is trying to make this work. Everyone is trying to make a great interface for home automation. Who's going to succeed? Who's going to get there? It's probably going to be a combination of them. And at some point, we will slowly evolve to where um, your favorite system, uh, whether that's your smartphone, platform, an Amazon Echo-like device, a combination of those two, some kind of physical remote, stuff that you've got mounted on the wall, and probably the lights themselves that may have microphones in them and listening to you, a combination of those things is probably going to drive home automation in the future. Is it going to change by huge leaps and bounds in 2016? No, but we're going to see these markets, uh, these markets, we're going to see these products that I talked about come out and people are going to start trying them out and trying more things with them and hopefully those companies who have made the products have more open ways of thinking and open APIs and that those products can work with other products and ultimately as a combination of all that when we get to a ubiquitous protocol for controlling all this stuff we then get to the point where we really start to see home automation and these Internet of Things devices adopted everywhere. And it really, and it's not the, the premise of this show, but beyond home automation, of course, we all know, we many of us work in office buildings, there's already um, building automation. You know, buildings have had automated lights, HVAC and whatnot for several years be, before home automation because, of course, businesses always want to save money that's part of the bottom line. Consumers are a little bit different animal, but businesses sort of have to answer to shareholders or you know the board or whatnot. So we've already seen that and we don't cover building automation. That's a whole different uh, topic, but the stuff already exists and now it's making it interesting and cool and easy um, for people to put into their own homes and to their own lives. And that's what we're talking about on this series along with our other topics. So in a long roundabout fashion, that's where we are. Is home automation gonna get so much better this year? Well, well, we'll see. Um, is it gonna get much better in two to three years? Yes, it's gotta get less confusing. There's gotta be sort of the killer app for it, just beyond energy savings, because people wanna do more than just save a couple cents. No, really, you can save more than a couple cents. But anyways, energy saving is definitely one of the tenants of home automation but the cool factor is there too and we'll bring you as many cool products as we can beyond just energy saving products but i think if you ask my opinion and of this show home automation to get less confusing easier to use and more powerful than it is today for the average consumer two to three years out now i said last year oh we're 18 months away but that was really before we kind of really saw the the effects of Apple and Google and others entering the market and kind of mucking it up while we're slowly also getting to the point where we're going to unmuck up the whole home automation market and get it to smooth out. I still think it's two to three years away because ultimately you've got to get these standards approved. 
you got to get manufacturers to adopt them into their products and you got to get the, you have to get those products out there into the market and into the hands of consumers and integrated into their home automation systems and their lives and i guess that's the bottom line all right um let's see i probably need to record something for the end of the show but i kind of can edit all that stuff together you're probably seeing this or maybe you're not all right whatever um that's the end of the show that's the end of our very long-winded wrap-up to home automation if you made it through the extended end of this episode super fantastic you get a gold star all right whatever um Stuff coming up on Lighting Answers. We are upgrading some of our camera equipment. You are going to see as of the next episode after this one, the extended version of the home automation spiel from CES, you're going to start seeing some new camera moves and some new cool shots. We promise you that. You're going to see some new products get reviewed. We've got a slew of things that are sort of waiting in the wings along with our projects and our tips, not just on lighting and how to light up furniture, but how to do some simple home automation tasks. We'll give you those in sort of a generalized fashion and how to apply those to whatever home automation system you're using. And you'll see more faces on lighting answers this year. Sooner than later, we're hoping. But anyways, we want to actually have more people on the show than just myself. I use the word we because we do have a small, very small army of people who I work with to bring these shows and to bring this information to you every single episode. If you haven't subscribed to the show and you've made it thus far, and I don't know how you made it this far, and if you're not subscribed, but if you're not subscribed, there's a button up there somewhere in that corner that you can subscribe to the show. And I highly recommend it to you because it will mean that more of our stuff will show up in your feed on YouTube. Of course, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Are we on Instagram? No, we could be, but it takes more effort and not much bang for the buck for what we do here. The website, lightinganswers.tv. A few articles, nothing spectacular, and it uh, they come and go as I have the time between writing, uh, between preparing these videos and actually creating articles so that those of you who may like to read can actually read something instead of actually sitting down and watching a video. The videos themselves um, for the short form ones are going to get more and more concise as time goes by. I actually do have a background in pro professional video production, but pro producing these videos and trying to edit uh, myself because I can tend to be long-winded, can tend to be weird. Anyways, uh, that gets to be a challenge. And sometimes I don't like producing videos that are overly scripted, but sometimes that works out better for length. And as we all know, no one has more than 60 seconds these days to watch a video on YouTube. Hopefully you do. What else? Subscribe, what's coming up, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's all right. Well, that's it. Um, if you want to support us, also, if you got to the very end of this episode, if you'd like to support us financially, if you say have a dollar a month or two or three bucks a month and you'd like to help us out, because every little bit helps. And if every single viewer gave like two or three bucks a month, we would be set. That would be super. You can go to patreon.com slash lighting answers and take a look and see what you might get as a perk and maybe you want to give us a buck or two that would be super and we will love you forever all right that's the end of the episode thanks for watching our series on ces lighting home automation all the cool stuff that came out of ces this year that's going to drive what we're going to see for the rest of the year and well we were going we will see what happens through the rest of 2016 and we'll bring it to you right here on Lighting Answers. I'm Jody Ganzik, and as always, I'll see you next time.